Greetings, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Why Is It Good? The YouTube channel dedicated to critical praise of pop culture artifacts great and small. My name is John, and tonight I'm drinking Four Roses Single Barrel. I hope they have it in the future, though it's not one of the drinks you can mix in this science fiction game called um, VA11 Hall A, or Valhalla cyberpunk bartending action. It's a visual novel and bartending simulator, but in the latter regard, it's about as much fun as real bartending. But like the burn of some alcoholic drinks, sometimes the game's gaminess isn't exactly the point. Anyway, Valhalla goes down just as smooth. It's really good. But the bigger question we have to ask is, why is it good? So, video games are typically about heroes. This is mostly for the players. No one wants to play a third-person going-to-school simulator. Well, okay, maybe Persona attracts a certain audience. Many, even most, video game settings are inherently escapist, even if they comment on real-world issues. We're attracted to the heroes of such settings because they complement this escapism. We want to be a wizard, or the hero of time, or a hamster on a robot ball, or anyone other than ourselves, because in most worlds, ordinary life is still pretty ordinary. You hold down a job, hang on to people and activities that give you joy, and try to leave a small legacy. It's also a design decision. Action keeps players interested in the game and creates more definite objectives. Go there and fetch the ring plays a lot nicer than conquer the fear of abandonment rooted in your childhood trauma. This again necessitates a heroic character, because your average shop owner or baker or town guard has normal priorities and a normal amount of motivation. So, in that regard, calling Valhalla a game feels sort of wrong. You do not play a hero, and it has very little heroic gameplay elements. You go on no quests, attack no one, and don't even really move. Your responsibilities are to advance dialogue, mix the drinks your patrons want, and manage your money. Calling it a game feels sort of wrong, but the interactivity makes it hard to call it anything else. This is far from the first time this dilemma has happened, and so gamers decided to call it a visual novel. The visual novel genre is a primarily Japanese phenomenon, a sort of digital choose-your-own-adventure story. There may be branching narrative paths, menial resource management or role-playing game elements, but most of it is just you clicking the text forward. Americans much preferred point-and-click adventure games, which required far more player agency. Leisure Suit Larry and Miss flirted with these ideas, sure, but they focused on puzzles first and foremost. Historically, visual novels have existed on the fringe of mainstream attention and appreciation. But thanks to the low risk and upfront publishing costs on Steam, and particularly creative entries like Doki Doki Literature Club, visual novels have enjoyed more attention in the West lately. An early and important example is Snatcher, one of the first pre-internet visual novels to arrive on American soil. Written by the venerable Hideo Kojima, its story of robots assuming human identities obviously borrows from Blade Runner. First released for Japanese-only computers in 1988, it was released here in 1994 for the Sega CD. When 3D games were on the horizon and the Sega CD was already a niche product, it naturally received very little attention outside of the gaming press. Kojima met the same fate until he directed a little-known game called Metal Gear Solid Tactical Espionage Action. While Valhalla most obviously borrows that game's subtitle, its developers have clearly followed Kojima since his earliest days. The most obvious influence lies in the game's setting and aesthetic. Valhalla is set in the year 20XX in a dystopian pixelscape called Glitch City. Here, corporations and government are interchangeable. Lifelike robots called Lilla mingle with humans, and nanomachines bury themselves into human flesh to keep dissenters in check. It's a dark but gorgeous setting, a rusty jungle of pink and purple neon and flashing lights. The combination of dystopian sci-fi, anime aesthetics, and bright pixel art is straight out of Snatcher and other 16-bit classics. The soundtrack complements this vibe particularly well. Composed by Alabama-based musician Michael Kelly, or as I will no doubt mispronounce, Garoed. It blends jazz, electronic, and techno into a bright glow of shimmery scents and electronic drums. Some critics would call it Vaporwave. Vaporwave. 
Vaporwave is a genre and aesthetic known for using nostalgic electronic sounds to produce a unique sensation of escapism, a sort of longing for memories you've never had and places you've never been. It's arguably one of the best game soundtracks in the last decade. Take a listen. Some of the music in Valhalla sounds straight out of an elevator or 90s infomercial is no accident. Indeed, it's fitting that a capitalist dystopia ruled by corporations encourages you to shop, oh pretty lights, and remember the comforting memories of your childhood. Such a setting lends itself to stories like those of Snatcher, where you play an elite detective diving into the city's seedy underbelly. Valhalla takes a different tack. You play a 20-something bartender named Jill who works in a dingy dive bar in a back alley. Said bar is named VA11 Hall A, there it goes again, but everyone just calls it Valhalla. Her story is a journey of deep-seated regret and a broken relationship, and it manifests like such a journey would for most of us. You talk it out with friends, ruminate, drink a little too much, and then eventually make some hard decisions and take some risks. Though Jill's melancholy and inner monologues flesh out Valhalla's narrative core, the NPCs, most of whom are customers, really describe her world. There's Dorothy, a childlike Lilum sex worker who is more than a bit raunchy, Alma, a tender-hearted hacker at the center of ever-present family drama, Donovan, a misogynistic but strangely endearing newspaper editor, and that's maybe one-fourth of the people you'll meet in Glitch City. Now, not all of these stories are riveting. Some of them are actually pretty dull and meander in unpredictable directions or don't clearly resolve at all. Valhalla does embrace the wacky absurdity of its anime heritage. There are talking dogs, robotic cat girls, plenty of fan service, even a dakimakura. You know, those creepy body pillows you see in cringe compilations. But through these disconnected anecdotes, arguments, confessions, and drunken soliloquies, you receive a remarkably well-formed picture of what it's like to live in a world that needs heroes but has no heroes. The only hero you meet is Say, who is sort of a cop? But even she is meek and tenderhearted after a few drinks and a few minutes with Jill. Despite her heroic feats, her story is that of a person left weary and wounded from her job, a public servant caught between duty and morality. So, why the focus on realism? Well, Valhalla's developers are from Venezuela, a country whose citizens have suffered tremendously after a socialist government went wrong. Anecdotes in the game reflect this reality. There's a mysterious hacker exposing government corruption, characters waiting in line for flower rations, an independent newspaper turning to yellow journalism for fear of government reprisal. Arguments for or against socialism are beyond the scope of this video, so please direct comments to my secretary, CuckWarNow75. But regardless of how you feel, it's important to never forget, and definitely not ignore, that underneath our comfortably distanced debates are real people, and subsequently real stakes. Common people. You know, NPCs. My boy George R. R. Martin said it best in A Game of Thrones. The common people pray for rain, healthy children, and a summer that never ends. It is no matter to them if the High Lords play their Game of Thrones, so long as they are left in peace. They never are. The men and women of Valhalla just want to be happy. Fate and feats of heroism be damned. Though you learn a lot about the world by interacting with them, you never find the solutions to its problems. They have more pressing things to worry about. Finding work, going to the new concert in town, or what that cute girl by the jukebox is up to. Art about normal people is not new. Early modern art was a reaction to paintings of gods and kings, an effort to find heartbreak and joy in the lives of ordinary people. Musicians, too, have largely turned from bardic tales of epic voyages to songs about universal emotions, love, loss, hope. While games have had a broad emotional palette for years, it's rare that they're mined from people not on a quest, or fulfilling a destiny, or serving some greater cause. If Valhalla's focus on NPCs feels like looking into a mirror, it's because most of us are NPCs. Valhalla taps into this exhaustion of being a nobody a feeling powerless, confused, and lost in a world you can't control but still have a deeply vested interest in. It's a feeling we relate to even when there's food on the table and the bills are paid. The idea that no matter how hard we try, some politician, random jerk, or just bad luck could take all of it from us in an instant. 
That Valhalla is a game, even in the loosest sense of the term, is critical to how it delivers this message. Many games claim that the player interacts with a persistent world, one that promises to exist beyond their interference. But even in immersive worlds like those of The Witcher 3 or Skyrim, suspiciously perfect scripted events and quest lines that just sit there while you play Gwent do little to serve that illusion. The world is catered to the player, and developers spend a ton of time trying to make us believe it is not. We likely won't see such limitations broken within a few generations, if even in our lifetimes. It's just how games are made. But with storytelling in games, the medium is inseparable from the message. So by maintaining only the essentials of player agency, while simultaneously showing a world where agency is a precious commodity, Valhalla's socio-political messages come through in a way that they otherwise might not. The small corner of the world that Jill explores and her equally small amount of influence in it are parallels to Valhalla's themes of hopelessness, regret, and class struggle. That those things exist on a foundation of anime, fan service, and memes is not only icing on the cake, but it's realistic in its own way. So one day, we'll have a game where you can truly live any life you want, even if that life is ordinary and boring. In the meantime, we'll have to settle for games like Valhalla. I'm not complaining. Anyway, Valhalla is available now on Steam and GOG, and ports are coming to the Switch and PS4 next year. If you'd like to see more from me, you can follow me on Twitter at TYBaseJohn, or visit my blog at whyitsgood.tumblr.com. If you like this video, be sure to drop a like and subscribe, because more content will be coming in the future. Thanks a lot for watching, and until next time, remember what you love.